everybody! My name is Kara from the Quab Wildlife Refuge. We're here today for another QWR, QWR Nature News. Before we get started though, we just wanted to thank everyone so much for um, supporting the refuge. A lot of people have um, been so kind as to do memberships to the refuge, so thanks to everybody who's done that. Our trails are open still from sunrise to sunset. You can still hike here at the refuge even though the nature center and the restrooms are closed. But um, we, we know that a lot of people have been enjoying the trails out there. Um, thanks for walking them in that counterclockwise direction and we're excited to bring you another QWR nature news today because it is June we are gonna continue doing QWR nature news on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. so you can tune in for that so today on nature news so today on nature news we're gonna talk about insects and mimics we're gonna talk about insects and mimics. <laughs> so we have some more mimics to present to you all today other than Renee. But um, so mimicry and insects kind of go hand in hand. There's a lot of mimics in the insect world. But what is an insect? An insect is an, an animal that has a segmented body and, se and segmented legs. They all have six legs and they exhibit bilateral symmetry, which means that the right half of their body looks the same as the left half of the body. So if you think of a butterfly, um, that's an animal that has bilateral symmetry or an insect that has bilateral symmetry. I'm gonna grab our um, insect for us to meet today, but all insects also have an exoskeleton. So um, that means that they have an external skeleton that keeps their bodies really safe. This is the um, animal that we're gonna meet today. Does anyone know what this is? This is an Indian walking stick. And I'm gonna try to get him or her to walk around a little bit. She's actually imitating a stick really well. Um, so you can see right here this Indian walking stick are some animals that we have in the nature center um, they're really cool animals that are from India so very far away from here on Long Island but we do have native animals and native stick insects so these Indian walking sticks they are herbivores they eat leaves and they eat um, usually leaves on the top of trees, but for our Indian walking sticks, they eat mostly romaine lettuce. And they have some really cool um, adaptations that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. They can live for around one to two years. They use spiracles on the sides of their bodies to breathe. And you can see they look just like a stick. Um, so these, these insects can live for one to two years like I was saying, and it takes a long time for them to reach this size, this really large um, size, because they will molt their exoskeleton throughout their life. They start super tiny, probably the size of your pinky finger when they hatch out of eggs. Stick bugs, like the Indian walking stick, are parthenogenetic, which means that females don't need a male to um, lay their eggs and hatch babies. So when these stick bugs are born, sometimes they're clones of their mother. They're all female. But something that's really interesting is that they, even though they're clones of their mother, um, the clones will end up kind of turning different colors later in their life, which is kind of um, against scientific thought because they should look exactly like their mom. Um, so scientists don't really know why that happens for the Indian walking stick. So really fascinating for these little little creatures, these Indian walking sticks. Um, but they, if they lose a leg, you can see actually that she has all six legs here. But if they lose a leg when they're younger, they can regrow their leg. And we're gonna talk a lot more about mimicry today in the insect world, in the animal world, but um, these insects are mimics. So they don't just camouflage. They take their camouflage a bit further and they are considered mimics. And that means that 
they don't just blend in to their habitat like an animal that camouflages, they actually imitate a stick. So they look like a stick and they act like a stick. And that means that they're a mimic. They're us utilizing and have evolved mimicry. Um, they have actually, stick bugs have been acting like sticks or imitating plants for 126 million years. So that's pretty amazing. But their goal, of course, is to survive. There's lots of predators out there that want to eat bugs, like birds and other insects, and they have to mimic their environment to better blend in or imitate their surroundings. So these Indian walking sticks will actually sway in the wind and act like a stick that's blowing in the breeze. If there was a predator around, they would um, kind of put all of their limbs out straight or down to the side and fall to the ground like a stick. So they are more than camouflaging, they are using mimicry, which is really, really cool. And I'm trying to get you guys a good view of her legs. Uh, on the bottom of their legs, they have these little hooks on the ends of their tarsus and I can't feel them even though I'm holding her um, because they're very lightweight creatures but that helps them walk through the forest and walk through trees um, so those little hooks will help them. I see a really good question how much do they sleep per day and that's an awesome question Logan I think we might have to do a little study because we don't actually know how long they sleep Per day but I do know that they spend most of their day resting because they want to stay hidden from predators so um, these Indian walking sticks if you come visit them when the nature center is back open uh, they usually sit just on the mesh really still they might sit with their front two legs in front of their body sticking out straight but they also have antenna so let me show you guys their cute little face and again, they only, they are herbivores, they only eat lettuces, but they are mimics. So again, we're gonna talk more about mimicry, but camouflage and mimicry are very different things. They're biologically different. So um, a cow, an animal that uses, utilizes camouflage blends into their environment. Um, they have evolved to basically have maybe coloration that makes them more cryptic um, to help them blend into their environment. But mimics or mi animals that use mimicry will imitate the traits of an unrelated animal or an unrelated thing and for the benefit of survival um, or maybe they get more food from that and they are they will also mimic physiological and behavioral traits instead of just blending in so a mimic's goal is to trick the senses to not just look like a stick but act like a stick too all right so Renee is gonna tell us a lot more about mimicry and thank you all for tuning in all right, so now we're gonna get a little more complex because mimicry is super complex and we're also gonna get possibly a little bit confusing because mimicry not only confuses predators um, and sometimes prey, we'll talk about that, but it also it seems to be a bit confusing to scientists. So there are lots of different theories out there. We took a deep dive into the internet, tried to find really great sources on this for you to try to give you some good, accurate information, but there are still ongoing theories, there's still ongoing studies, and they're learning more and more every day about mimics. Um, they have to study and look back at their um, taxonomic classifications, they have to look back at where they fall, um, their genetics, where they fall in evolution. So there's a lot of things that scientists are studying to see are these animals co-mimics of each other? Is one specifically mimicking another? Um, did they evolve all together? So there's a lot of different theories. So I'm just going to kind of touch on a few, talk about a few that fall into these categories or possibly multiple categories. Um, and first I want to start with a theory that's called Batesian mimicry. So Batesian mimicry is basically when one of the animals is toxic or noxious or has some sort of coloration that we call um, a posmatic coloration um, or even some of these things can be op a posmatic things like um, 
a sound that they make possibly. So something that's kind of scaring away other animals or predators. And then the other animal, it has none of these things, but looks like the animal that may be toxic or unpalatable or dangerous. So an example that's often used for this are these guys right here. So I know my picture is a little pixelated, maybe extra pixelated on the camera, but this is a scarlet king snake up top and this is a coral snake down below. So you may have heard the old rhyme and um, it's red touches yellow, kill a fellow, red touches black, friend of Jack. You might have heard that rhyme, right? So the, the coral snake is a very venomous snake. Um, and the king snake, this scarlet king snake, is a non-venomous snake. So originally they had thought that these guys fit into the Batesian category because one is they believe that this snake is actually mimicking a venomous snake so predators won't prey on it. However, they still are not completely sure if that's the right category for this because the coral snake may be in fact imitating the king snake. And why would they do that? Why would they want to do that? Because some very venomous animals will actually mimic less venomous or less dangerous animals because if an animal was to consume this guy, they would, or, or get bit by this one, right? They would die and they wouldn't pass on the information that they are dangerous. But if an animal was to get bit or injured by a king snake and go on to survive, they would teach other animals to stay away from them. So sometimes it's actually, actually beneficial to be less noxious or less venomous, right? So that's actually helpful to them. So that theory is what we call Mertensian mimicry. So which one is which? They have to study the, ge uh, the genetics of these animals, maybe the evolution of these animals, maybe look for examples in um, their classification who evolved first. So a little confusing, right? <laughs> Very complex. I'm going to give another example. All right. So another kind of example of an animal, or Batesian mimicry, an animal that mimics another are these guys right here, butterflies, right? So the monarch butterfly is a butterfly that consumes what's called milkweed. And milkweed, when it's consumed by monarch caterpillars, it in fact makes them toxic to eat or actually unpalatable. So it depends on who's eating them, whether it's just really sour tasting or actually dangerous and poisonous to them. So the monarch butterfly up here eats, feeds on milkweeds and the caterpillars feed on milkweed. So most animals have known to avoid them. And we've talked about this a couple times in our nature news, but these orange colors, these bright orange and red colors are just like a warning symbol to many animals. They recognize that. Another animal that feeds on milkweed is this lower one called the queen butterfly. And queen butterflies look very similar, don't they? So queen butterflies also feed on milkweed, so in fact they are unpalatable to many animals as well, or toxic or poisonous to some animals. So many animals know to avoid these guys. So are they co-mimics? Possibly, right? Um, the viceroy butterfly is really strange in this because viceroy butterflies in some areas are not toxic at all, not unpalatable, they are just normal butterflies. And they've found correlation that in areas where there's a high population of queen butterflies, these guys are usually not noxious or unpalatable. So they are just fine for other animals to eat, but most animals avoid them because they recognize the queen butterfly. They look so similar, they avoid both. So in some areas where there are no queen butterflies and just viceroy butterflies, they've actually found out that viceroy butterflies are noxious or unpalatable in those areas. So they can develop in those areas, they've evolved and adapted because the animals in those areas don't know to avoid them. Whereas in areas where the queen butterfly is, they did really strange, right? So they're still learning more things. They're still finding out more of this information. Pretty amazing. All right. So 
all of these examples I'm giving you right now are more of defensive mimicry. So here's one more example of defensive mimicry. This is malarian mimicry. And malarian mimicry suggests that these guys all kind of co-evolved to look like each other. So both may have some sort of level of um, toxicity or unpalatability or maybe a dangerous sound that they make, but they all evolved this together because it helps them as a whole. It helps them as a whole to look very similar because animals then just avoid them together. So these are um, a family of butterflies. They're Heliconius butterflies. So they're a family of different butterflies. I'm gonna get up as close as I can for you, but you can see they look so similar. And the resemblance helps to protect all of them. So all of these are in some level unpalatable or poisonous to each animal, and it helps them all together as one. So sometimes it can be within a family or a group. Sometimes it's another animal co-mimicking they're co-mimicking each other and it just helps them. They don't have to be related at all to do that. So there are some examples of aggressive mimicry or um, non-defensive mimicry. So one of those examples is this guy right here. Can you even tell what's in there? Doesn't it look just like a leaf? Does anybody know what this is? This is called a katydid. This is the katydid right here, and you can see, kind of looks like a stick bug body, right? Katydid. So katydids are really amazing. There's so many different types of katydids and different species of katydids, so it depends on which species we're talking about. But one of the species of katydids, what they do is they actually mimic the sound. So mimicry is not always by luck. They mimic the sound of cicadas, actually female cicadas. So they'll make the sound of a female cicada and what that will do, it will entice the male cicadas to come over to mate. And when they come over, the actually, the katydids will then actually eat and feed on the male cicadas. So they trick them and they lure them in. Pretty intense, right? Pretty crazy. You might know other animals that do this, right? Like alligator snapping turtles. Inside of their mouth, they have a little lure that looks like a little worm. And it lures small fish and other animals in, in order to prey on them. Or an angler fish, right? Angler fish have that big light that attracts small prey and they can consume them. So these are forms of aggressive mimicry. So, uh, the last kind of topic of memory, mimicry I want to talk about is called auto mimicry. So, auto mimicry is a little bit confusing in its term because auto, you think that it's mimicking itself. Sometimes it is. So, sometimes part of the animal's body is mimicking a different part of its body, like this, for example. And we talked about this a little with the kestrel, if you remember. So, this is a pygmy owl. And you can see this is the front facing view of the pygmy owl. This is the back facing view of the pygmy owl. Looks like eyes, doesn't it? So the back pattern coloration is made out to resemble the eyes. And what that helps on is you may have seen small birds mob predators. They will kind of swoop down and go for the backs of predators as they're flying, predatory birds like raptors. Um, and this, having eyes in the back of their head, or what looks like eyes in the back of their head, will help to deter them from doing that. We saw that on the kestrel too, so some of the birds of prey have this. Really cool, right? Auto mimicry. Um, auto mimicry also, Tony talked a little bit about auto mimicry in our sunfish, because the smaller male sunfish will mimic the females so they can come in and they can trick the more bigger aggressive males, they can trick them and get closer so they can fertilize some of the female's eggs. So they mimic uh, um, an animal of the same species but a female instead of um, looking like a, a, a larger male that may be competing, right? So this one right here, an owl butterfly. So these guys are mimicking the patterns of an owl's eyes. So they can confuse predators that way. 
a good way to camouflage, right? But it's more than that because of the way that they move their bodies, it's mimicry. They're mimicking these patterns. Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. So very complex, lots of different examples. Some of them fall into different categories and overlap within their categories. So it could be a little bit confusing, but mimicry is really amazing. There's so many different animals that are mimics of one, one another and scientists are still studying these things and there's so many different theories about them. So we just covered a few today. So I'm gonna give you guys a little time for questions. I think I see one question here. I'm just gonna get really close to the camera to read it. Um, if they all wanna look the same, why are they different colors? Good question, Eileen. Um, because of evolution, they are different colors and different areas. I'm sorry, I'm just looking for that picture for you. Which one is it? Oh, here we go. <laughs> this one. The one that, the first one that I picked up that was upside down. So they've just kind of evolved different patterns in different areas, maybe because of, it could be environmental reasons. Maybe they camouflage slightly better in certain environments. Um, it could be for all different reasons and that's what scientists are studying. Why do some of these look very different whereas others look almost, almost the same? Look at these two right here. So they're still studying these guys. Any other questions? Oh yeah, Kara has another example for you guys. Yeah, so like Renee said, there are so many animals that use mimicry and also camouflage. So next time you're on a hike, maybe you'll notice an animal that's using camouflage or maybe you'll notice an animal using mimicry. We want to know if you think thought of any animals that are mimics. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with this type of feather right here from a peacock. They'll use mimicry to make themselves look bigger. All of their tail feathers will have what looks like eyeballs. And when they fan their tail feather, it's attractive for females, but it also will scare away a predator. Um, so thank you all so much. We really appreciate you tuning in to QWR Nature News. Our next Nature News will be on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day.